Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the September Q&A for 101 Mixing Tricks. I hope you're enjoying the mixing tricks so far, and I hope you have uh, a lot of questions for me today. Actually, there's a lot already. I was actually surprised because there's more questions than usual and unfortunately i won't be able to get to them all all of them that have been already submitted get to as many as we can but i do want to leave some time open for some people that are on the call right now so i see tim here stands here hey guys and who else do we have looking there's uh Eight people so far, 10 people so far. So let's begin. First of all, I want to tell you that uh, this is kind of exciting, I think. As of today, the majority of 101 Mixing Tricks videos are now in full HD, it's modules one through four are totally HD, as well as all of the bonus videos. And I think four or five of module five is, as well. So you can expect them all to be fully HD. Most of them are 1080p, a few are 720, but most of them are 1080p. And you can expect them all to be HD in the next few days. So you asked for it, and we did our best to actually give you what you want, and boy, they look a lot better, and uh, glad we did. So you'll be happy about that. Another thing I want to announce is there's going to be two upcoming events that I'm going to be giving, and please give me some feedback on this as well. The first one is a mixing boot camp and famous studio field trip, and what I would like to do here is have a mixing boot camp to help all of you, whoever attends, with any of the problems that you might have uh, and help you get better mixes, but also to do a field trip to all of the great Hollywood studios that I'm sure you've heard about before. That would be Record Plan, Ocean Way, Capital, uh, Village, a um, few of, like that, a few more. And uh, as well as I'll take. Um, We'll look at a couple gear manufacturers and you'll see the making of some gears and microphones and things like that that you might like, as well as uh, we'll have dinner with a celebrity mixer, someone that you've heard their work uh, over and over and over. And the other event that I'd like to announce would be the Winter NAM Walkabout. And what you'll get for this is a free ticket to NAM, as well as the insider demos that I get. So in other words, when I walk around and I get a demo from someone at NAM, it's different than most people get. Because usually I get either the creator of the product or I get a VP of, of marketing or engineering or I get somebody that gives me a special demo of the product. And uh, I'm very thankful that I get that, but most other people don't, but you will. If you come on the Winter NAM walkabout with me, and uh, we'll also have uh, a meet and greet with some music celebrities, as well as uh, dinner and private Q&A. So stay tuned for all the information about that. You'll be seeing that in the coming next coming week or so. So that's uh, two upcoming events. Uh, give me some ideas if you like this or not, if it's a good idea, if you think it's something that uh, you'd be into. Uh, just uh, drop me a note here in the chat on the side. So now let's get into it. Stan has a couple of questions, and Stan, I see you're on here. The first is, um, what are the most common phase problems? How are they detected and eliminated? Or even better, how are they avoided? Well, the, the there's a couple that come to mind. The first one is usually between the a direct bass and a mic'd bass. And you'll usually see some phase problems that will happen. And some people 
think that sounds good and some people thinks, think, think that it doesn't, so they'll fix it. Um, sometimes if you fix the phase, in other words, you move both tracks so the waveforms are exactly the same, exactly the same place, you'll find it's bigger and fuller. So that's one thing. The other common phase thing that I see a lot would be uh, things like um, snare drum under and over. So usually what will happen is if you have um, a mic under the snare, if you flip it 180 degrees out of phase, it will sound bigger and fuller. The snare will sound bigger and fuller when you put them both together. That being said, I've seen a lot of engineers not do that and get great sounds. So those are two things. Um, phase problems a lot. Most of the time, if you have a bad phase phase problem, it's more of a polarity problem, meaning that there's a cable that's miswired, and that really is the worst kind of phase problem you can have. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's really bad, and, and there's nothing you can do. If you don't fix it right in the beginning, you're kind of done because there's nothing that can fix it later. So... Those, and, and how would you avoid them? Well, the first thing I would do, uh, especially on that last thing we're talking about, is um, you go through, you take one microphone, if you're tracking, for instance, and you call that your golden standard. And it doesn't matter what it is, which mic could be a kick drum mic or a snare drum mic or a guitar mic, doesn't matter. But then you go and you compare all the other microphones to it. In other words, you hold them both up side by side and you speak into them and you flip the phase on the mic that you're testing and you pick the the selection that sounds the biggest and fullest and you just go through all the mics we got 20 mics in the session you go through them all and that's the easiest way to actually get around that um as far as uh, other problems phase problems yeah i mean I, you'll find people and en some engineers are much more particular about phase than others and there, there's one in particular, uh, Pete Moshe, who does uh, Live at Daryl's House, for instance. He gets great sounds. And when I asked him how he does it, you know, within the live environment that he's doing that show in, he says it's mostly due to checking phase. And he says he spends, you know, half of his day setting the microphones so the phase is just right. And uh, I have to ask him to explain that a little bit more next time I talk to him. But, uh, you know, some people are, are much more concerned than others. Okay, when, number two, when listening to new releases, I find it hard to compare my raw mixes uh, that, do, that don't even come close to the finished mastered mixers, mixes of today's hits. Yeah, you know, it's a real art to get. Uh, well, first of all, you'll find that, forget about mastering for a second, most engineers are that are doing pop hits especially are really smashing the stereo bus. Lots and lots and lots of compression. There's compression everywhere and there's lots of it. So that's a big part of it right there. And they get every last ounce of level. And then they send it to mastering and mastering tries to get even more out. So that's a big part of it. But really when it comes down to it, you can't compete against a mastering engineer you can get close but you're never going to get as loud as a mastering engineer because you don't have the same tools and you don't have the same listening environment a mastering engineer can hear things that you'll never be able to and and i say this with 99 percent certainty because no matter how good your room is it's not made for mastering if most chances are if you're on this call so um that's why still, you know, you have great engineers, great mixing engineers that still always send their mixes to mastering. So, I mean, that's <laughs> that's just a big part of, of making records these days. Uh, number three, a cool bonus would be getting into some horn mixing. And, uh, okay, I will definitely get something together on that. So, you know, we'll definitely do it. That'll be cool. Um don't forget here, if you guys have any questions, you can just hit me over here on the right on the um, on the chat section. So uh, 
You can start a cue those up if you want. Let's go to the next question. This is from John. When I create groups of instrument tracks, let's say drums or strings, how exactly is that co accomplished? Uh, let's see. I would do a submix of a group into a stereo track, so I'm able to treat the track differently from the individual tracks, especially if there's a lot of tracks in the group that require complex automation. Is this one form of creating groups? Okay, I guess you can do it that way. Um, I'm not sure if you're talking about you're bouncing, you're creating a new stereo track, which that's one way to do it. Uh, let me actually, I'm going to get Pro Tools up here for a second so I can show you something. And just give me a second here. And okay. Hopefully you can hear, you can see Pro Tools here. So basically we, th there's two different things here. We get a submix is different from a group. So for instance, these two faders here are grouped. It's a top mic and a bottom mic on a snare. They're grouped in, and what that means is when I move one, doesn't matter which one, the other one moves as well. And I have the same thing with the toms as well. So, and I have the same thing with the overheads as well, and I have the same thing with the organ here. So that, that's a group. Um, a subgroup is right here. Now, basically, these two faders, these two organ faders, the high and low on, on the B3, they feed into the organ here. They feed into the, the organ subgroup. And the reason why I want that is, yes, I can control the level up and down, but also I can add EQ, I can add effects. So instead of having to do it on both faders here, and let's say I have a, what if I had, you know, 10 background vocals, instead of EQing each one, I can just do one subgroup. So that's the difference there. Um, every digital audio workstation has, you can do both on, on every one. So just remember, group is different from the subgroup, the submix, and you'll just have to find on your particular DAW exactly how to do that. But um, I hope that helps you. And let me get back here. Let's um, there we go. Okay. Question number two. To record and mix at 96.24 or 48.24, what are the pros and cons? Uh, well, let's just start right there. 96.24 is the better way to go. First of all, it will sound a little better because your resolution is higher. So you're going to get higher frequency response. So that's good. Um, the other thing is it's better from an archi archival standpoint because 10 years from now when everybody is streaming or getting whatever it is uh their music in high resolution then you already you want the stuff that you've recorded today to be in high resolution so you're better off to do do it like that if you can 4824 will give you a great sound as well uh, especially on some some music, you won't notice too much of a difference. But um, I try to do everything at 96.24 if I can. Let's see. If my source material is recorded at 96.24, but I'm required to mix my session at 48.24, vice versa. Uh, okay. It, it, understand, if you record at 96.24, you should mix at 96.24. Don't change. If, for instance, someone wants a 48k mix and usually they want 48k for video then you just output it like that then you, you when you bounce it you export it you just say i exported it 4824 if you need an export for a cd that's 44116 so you just export it at 44116 but you always mix at the same resolution that you recorded at okay and next part he says if the source was recorded at 48.24 and mixed at 96.24. Is it any detriment in sound quality that will be audibly evident? 
um there's no detriment but there's no advantage you can go down in resolution but you can't go up well you can there's just no advantage um and what it does it just makes the session bigger so <laughs> there's no reason to do it if you record at 20 at 48 24 you're stuck at 48 24 because you, you can output it at whatever at 96 192 at 384 it doesn't matter there's no advantage and that's why you're always better off to record it as high record at as high resolution as you can because you can always down mix later you can't up mix and again you can you just don't get any advantage to it so that's why you don't want to do it so john i hope i answered your question there and let's go to the next one from victor i have a great set of monitors that when i play the cd in my car it usually sounds mono and thin can you recommend a brand of speakers that have car quality that i can double check the music in my studio um victor also sent three or four emails after this uh with questions that kind of revolve around this one and victor this is a problem that a lot of people have you're not the only one and basically what it means is the mixes in your control room are not translating to the outside world they may sound terrific in your control room but they're not translating anywhere else it happens to a lot of people so and, and this has been a problem for 50 years for mixers so it's not something that you know just happened to you here's the thing you should get a great recording get a cd that you really love and you think it sounds great it doesn't matter what it is it doesn't even matter if other people agree with you that it sounds great listen to it in your car and then listen to it back in your control room and see what the differences are see what it's missing see if if there's something that's added in your control room chances are what's happening is you're hearing too much bass in your control room and it doesn't sound and the real world doesn't have that same amount of bass and almost always that's the problem you either have too much low end or not enough so here's what most people do they figure out they just listen to a bunch of cds in different environments and they come back and they compare in your control room it takes a while it doesn't it's not something that happens overnight but then you'll keep on listening back and forth back and forth back and forth and you'll find out where the problems are and then you'll compensate for it and again that's kind of what everybody's always done now the other thing you can do is as you asked um get another set of speakers uh in the old days, in the 60s and 70s, mostly 70s, I guess, it was Aurotones that people used, and those were five-inch, uh, four or five-inch speakers. I don't remember what they were. They were really crappy, but they were supposed to emulate what a television sounded like because that was kind of like the standard speaker of a television at the time. And that's what everybody mixed on. And the idea was if it sounded good on that, it'll sound great in anything else what i do and most other mixers do is they'll mix on the crappiest set of computer speakers that you can find i'm not saying do the entire mix but at least listen to that the mix on these crappy computer speakers if it sounds good on the crappy computer speakers it will sound really good everywhere else and so you mix on your main speakers you'll compare back on the crappy speakers um, some people just do it some mixers just do it on their laptop speakers and if they can get it to sound great in the laptop speakers, then it'll sound great anywhere else. So that's the common thing. So, Victor, that's that's what I would do. But it's not something that you can fix just by going and buying some speakers. You really have to do some listening. David says, I would like to understand better the phase shifting between drum mics. Is it possible that checking all the mics with the overheads will put out the phase of other sources? say a hi-hat mic with the snare i see people aligning drum tracks on their daws again i don't understand how it can work um okay let's talk about this yeah people go a little well a lot of people will mix with their eyes instead of their ears 
and you'll look at what looks to sound right rather than listening. Again, this isn't new. This goes way, way back. I remember doing a session with Roy Thomas Baker way, way back when. And um, I was shocked because as soon as the band started, all the meters peaked. They went into the red as high as they can go, and they didn't come back until the band stopped. And I was shocked. And basically the way he got me over that was to just <laughs> cover up all the meters. And um, then he just learned to listen, and it was like, oh, okay, I get it. Oh, it sounds pretty good, actually. But um, if you mix with your eyes, you you start to do stuff that you probably shouldn't. And this is one of those things. When people begin to take drum tracks and align them, and when I mean align them, it means that the waveforms align. So the, the, the waveform going up is the same, is the same place on every track and going down is the same on every place. Well, that's not natural. That's not the way we're hearing things. So if you try to do that, you get a very sterile recording or a mix, I should say. So that's something that I wouldn't do. I see people doing it. And I hear of them doing it, but um, that's not really a good thing. So again, don't be too crazy about this, about lining up phase. I'd be more concerned about polarity, meaning go to the phase switch. If you flip a phase switch on one of the drums and it sounds bigger, then that's where you want to leave the, the selection at. So, um, you know, just go through all of your drums and do that. Flip the phase on each single track and select the one where it sounds the biggest. Simple as that. Okay, uh, what else do you say? does he say? I understand that we're looking for the best compromise rather than phase perfection. And even so, with the individual drum mics going out of phase between them during this process. Yeah, you know, again, being slightly out of phase is normal. You're never going to be completely in phase. What we're looking for is extremes. If there's something that's extremely out of phase, it's 180 degrees out of phase, that's bad. And it stays there. That's bad. It's no good. But to have, you know, things drift in and out of phase, that's just normal. Okay, Victor again. I recently watched a mastering video recommended always using dithering when moving from a 24-bit to a 16-bit, claiming that dithering soft, softens the edges of the digital waveform and makes it uh, more of an audio waveform, more natural sounding. Uh, uh, okay, you got that a little wrong, but here's the deal with dithering. If you're not mastering, don't worry about it. Dithering should only happen once and only once in the whole process. And, and the only time don't worry about it. And the other thing is the difference between dithering and not dithering is small. On some music, you won't even hear it. On other music, you will. And where you tend to hear it is on things like reverb trails. So if you don't have a lot of reverb trails that are, are naked by themselves, you, chances are you won't hear it. But that being said, if you're going to a mastering engineer, let the mastering engineer do it. Don't even think about it. This is something that, you know, it's not, it's not even worth considering unless, you know, again, you're making a CD you have to be in 16 bit. And then, you know, you only want to do it once and that's it. Uh, from John. Hey, all the album tracks are ready to release. Good one, John. I have an offer from an LA-based internet radio. Uh, to do a phone interview and put all the tracks out there in rotation. However, due to no budget, I'm unable to use a professional mastering engineer. I have to do it on my own, but enter, enter Lander. Lander. Have you ever done any research on Lander, the artificial intelligent way of mastering? Curious your take. They claim... Never to replace the real deal. Uh, yeah, I, I've checked this out. And what this is, it's an online service. You upload your your track, and it automatically analyzes it and masters it. Um, it didn't work for me, but I always go to a mastering engineer. It's not the same thing. <laughs> Um, so I, it didn't work for me is all I can say. I heard it work. Um, 
it's $39, I think, $39 a month. I don't know why it's a monthly charge. It shouldn't be, but nonetheless, if you want to spend 39 bucks and you feel that it works for you, great. Um, I don't, don't see a problem. Uh, if you don't have any other choice, then do it. Uh, I, you know, so it's not going to take the place of a real mastering engineer, but if it's better than what you have, then it's worth it. It's worth the money. Okay, John. Joe says, oh, the Elton John piano sound trick. Is this recommended for tracks not recorded with the real acoustic piano? Um, yeah, it doesn't matter what kind of piano, Joe. I got this method from uh, Ken Scott, who recorded a lot of the early Elton John albums. I think he did the first three or four. And no, he didn't do the first one. He mixed the first one. I don't think he recorded it, but he, he did all the other ones. So this came from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And really, uh, you know, what they wanted to do, in in a lot of cases, it was that they had this great piano at Trident. It's almost like a one-of-a-kind sound, Trident Recording Studios. And it was really, really bright. So when he didn't record there, they wanted to get that same sound, so they had to do it somehow. And, and that's what this method is. And it's basically using... Uh, pull text and LA2s to boost up the high end to give it that really bright trident sound. That's what it is. So yeah, it'll work on anything. It'll work on a real piano. It'll work on a sampled piano. It doesn't matter. But, you know, again, the whole thing is if, if it doesn't work in the track, it's no good to you. So if you find that it sounds good in the track, then it is good. And if it doesn't work in the track, then, <laughs> you know, try something else. Okay. Uh, next one. Hi, Bobby. You exchange Pro Tools native EQ with the Oxford one because it's cleaner. What does that actually mean? How would you hear this? Thanks for again for a great program. It's from Harry. Thanks, Harry. And he's talking about trick number 12, the EQ'd mix bus trick. Okay, here, so here's what happened. Uh, I think I started with this, with that trick, using just the standard Pro Tools regular EQ and EQ'd a little and then said, okay, now let's try it with another EQ because it sounds a little cleaner, and then went to the Oxford one. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? Well, not every EQ sounds the same. Um, the algorithms are different. The, um, the way they put together is different. So as a result, they have different sounds. Um, so what ends up happening is there are some cases where you can really hear that difference and other cases where you can't. Now, for instance, the, the reason why I like the Oxford is that you can really hear tiny little differences a lot. So, for instance, if you were to do a half a dB, you can hear it. It makes a difference. If you do it on other types of EQs or other models of EQ, you might not hear that half dB or it will sound different. It will sound, it, it won't sound as musical, you know, in that application. So that's basically what I mean. And, you know, again, whatever I use, it works for me or it worked in that situation, but I might not use that same thing in another situation and neither should you, you know, try other things and see how they work because not everything works in every situation. And let's see, what's the next one here? From Jared. My question for you as an engineer is used real old school consoles and tape and now mixing in the box. Do you find that any of the console and tape emulation plugins have much use in your mixes or that they bring you a little closer to the sounds of yesterday? Okay, before I go on here, um, let me tell you that I'm not nostalgic for the way things used to sound at all. <laughs> it, it, it just wasn't that great to me. There, there are certain times when things sounded great and wonderful, but there are other times when it didn't. So I'm not nostalgic at all for that sound, uh, especially tape. 
tape emulation to me. I, I could care less about it. So I never use these. Uh, I'm happy with the sounds I get without any of this simulation. It, so um, does it sound like that? Uh, uh, I guess, but really it doesn't, it's not something I use or much care about. So I don't know if I'm the right person to talk to about, about this, but you can, you have to be careful because sometimes you can get roped into this train of thought where you think that the stuff is the answer, the fix that, you know, everybody needs and, or you need for your mix. And it's really easy to go kind of overboard on it when, you know, maybe what you had before was really good you really didn't need it. Um, when I talk to people that do use these, they don't use much. I mean, so little you'd be amazed. And, um, but I just don't talk to too many people in, in my sphere anyway, that seems to use these a lot or rave over them. So, um, Gee, I hope you guys are seeing all these. Uh, <laughs> boy, I just noticed this now. I hope you guys are seeing the screen before. And if you're not, if you weren't seeing the screen, I really apologize. I just saw this now. That wasn't screen sharing. Sorry. Okay. Well, anyway, let's get to the live portion of this. I see a couple of questions here. Uh, Tim says, Hail to the King by Avenged Sevenfold is one of the most powerful and perfect kicks I've ever heard. Crystal clear and defined, powerful, but never stepping on anything. Any advice, insight, how this was achieved? Well, as I recall, um, it, it's kind of typical for this kind of music, what ends up happening. Um, there's a lot of 3K and you know the sound of kicks have changed over the years once upon a time <laughs> i can remember when i first was learning how to do this in in the studio the first person i talked to um first engineer was showing me how to do things on the kick drum took the treble and turned it all the way down says well, you don't need any of that <laughs> and we've changed completely where now you know that's a big part of the sound of the kick and especially on this so don't overlook the high end, and, and that's a big part of it. Um, many times it's scooped at 400 hertz as well, a little bit, um, between 250 and 400. But it has to work with everything else, so that that's the big trick. You have to sit and you have to listen. If you're, you're trying to get that sound, you listen against the bass, you listen against the other drums, you listen against guitars, you listen against everything. Uh, especially the vocal. If you're adding like a lot of 3K, uh, it might... You know, get in the way of the vocal, so you have to, you know, juggle those frequencies. But a lot of that has to do with, you know, the amount of of mid range there. Okay, Victor, I know I have a phase problem when the volume drops. Volume doesn't drop, I ignore it. Well, the volume shouldn't drop unless you go to mono. Um, if you go to mono and your volume drops, boy, you get a big problem. Otherwise, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, so uh think about that victor john says uh save time searching for eq eqs and compressors when you're dealing with any instrument tracks would it make sense to insert a channel strip like a waves ssl or oh okay so you're just saying oh, it should in, instead of individually inserting them on a track as needed would it be better to just have a channel strip all lined up? You know, yeah. I mean, if if you have a channel strip that you really like and, and you tend to use it on everything, sure. I don't see a problem with that. Um, and most consoles, obviously, you know, are like that because they have uh, the same, uh, you know, uh, channel strip for each channel strip. So, um you know, it's not a problem there, generally speaking. So, yeah, I don't, you know, if it's faster for you and if it's something you really like, yeah, do it. Alberto says, hey, Bobby. Hello, Alberto. Jim, 
asks, will dithering do anything for an MP3 either before or after converting? No, it won't. Um, let me take that back. Under most circumstances, it won't. There's a few circumstances where it might. Uh, now, the, let me give you those, first of all. If you have a... If you're doing something that has a... Um, lots of dynamics, a jazz song, for instance, there, it's very open, there's not a lot of instruments, there's lots of dynamics. Maybe, in, in that case... It might help you. I doubt it. I doubt it. Because what ends up happening with an MP3, the way it throws things away, it probably is not, you know, it's not going to sound too much better or worse on one or the other. So, um, again, dithering was made for one reason, one reason only. It's for in the making of CDs. And it was important in the early days, less so than it is today. In the early days, it sounded really bad if you were to what they call truncate. And that, that would be you chop off the last eight bits from 24 to 16. It would, it would sound bad. You would really hear it. But this was during the early days of the CD in the 80s. And eventually everything got to the point where that wasn't as much of a problem anymore. So you can dither or not dither, and I chances are you're not going to hear it one way or the other. Um, better if you do it in the right right time and right place. But you know, again, this is something from the early days of digital that was really important then. It's not as important today. Uh, Robert says uh, normally I'd record Pro Tools 2496. Is there any real advantage of using 32-bit floating point over 24-bit? Um, I haven't found it so. I haven't talked to many people that have done that on a regular basis. Um, theoretically, it's supposed to be better and it should sound better. I just don't know of anybody that does that, to be honest with you. I'm sure there are people that do it. I don't know of anybody. So um, for the hassle that you might get because of doing it that way, I'm not sure if it's worth it. Because, you know, again, what happens is you want everything to be compatible. So if you have to move to another version of the workstation, you have to work, move to another workstation, another studio or whatever, and, you know, sometimes there's a compatibility problem if you're moving... Um, if you're moving plugins and things like that, some plugins will like it and some won't. You know, that's the hassle that you have. So you try to eliminate as many of those hassles as you can. Alberto says, when mastering my own album, the final volume of each song is different and is slightly noticeable when listening over and over. Any suggestions how to keep the final volume and levels the same? Well, see, that's the whole thing about mastering. It's not the EQ. It's that's the trick of mastering, to make every song sound the same, the same level. So everybody, when they think of mastering, they think of adding, adding EQ and compression. Yeah, that's that's not what most mastering guys do. I mean, when they spend time doing this, doing an album, they're constantly going back and forth between songs, always. You do that first song, you get it, and then you're going back and forth back and forth, back and listening is the same, is the same, is the same level. So you're not doing that enough, Alberto. That's a, you know, that's mastering. It's not adding EQ and compression. I mean, yeah, it's part of it, but it's not the big part. The big part is making all the songs sound the same, sound like they're, they're done at the same time by the same people. That's what you're trying to do. So, um, you're just not comparing enough. And that's the only thing that, that, that guys will do, that mastering engineers will do. They'll listen constantly back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and, back and, forth and, and all the songs. And when they finish them off, there's 10 songs, then they listen to them all back and forth, back and forth. It might take them 20 minutes just to go back and forth, just checking the level back and forth. And, and they'll goose it up a 10th of a DB here and down a 10th of a DB. And, and back, you know, that's the thing. You probably didn't do that. I bet. Okay, John, again, um, 
Should I run my sessions in ISIS 24 to get the best possible sound quality, or is 40? 4824 fine. I'd say run it at 9624 if you can. If it's not a hassle, yes, do it that way. And uh, you want to do it that way because of not so much today, but the future. Because sooner or later, everything is going to be broadcast or streamed in high def. So you want to be ready for it. So uh, I would, if it's entirely possible, that being said, it's possible to get some good sounds with 4824, and there's certain music, you know, if you're doing hard rock or something, you won't hear too much of a difference, but frankly, I would always rather go to the higher um, sample rate. I love 192.24. I love the sound of it much more than 96.24, I got to say, but the hassles are far too great to do. So um, that's the big problem there. Okay, anybody else have any more questions? Happy to answer anything else that you might have. Um, so please, now's the time to hit me with them. Um, I'm going to go back here real quick on my slides. Just, you know, again, I, I want to hit you to this. So two upcoming events here that we're going to have, the Mixing Boot Camp and Famous Studio Field Trip and the Winter Nam Walkabout. Give me your feedback on this. Tell me if these sound like a good idea, something you know you'd be interested in at some point in time. And uh, we're going to roll them out pretty soon if uh, you guys seem to like them. So I just want to make sure that uh, you guys know about this. And, and if you're excited about it, then we'll, we'll carry on. And if you're not, then we'll think of something else. <laughs> okay. So let's go back here. Anybody have any more questions? Let's go back through this here. Live Q and A. Okay, it doesn't look like it. If that's the case, once again, you know, thanks for being here. Thanks for being on the call. Uh, you can hear a replay of this. It's going to be on the Q and A section of your dashboard and 101 mixing tricks. And the other thing is, um, I just want to remind you that all the videos probably by the weekend or by the end of the weekend, they're all going to be finally HD. It's all 101 mixing tricks plus the bonuses and as well as all of them from now on. And um, keep on sending me your questions, comments, any of those things. I listen to you all the time. Oh, Stan has a question. Calibrating a subwoofer. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here's the, the way to do it. Um, what you want to do is um, put pink noise into the subwoofer. First of all, calibrate the, um, get, uh, you want to get like a sound level meter. Put it on your phone, get a, get a, uh, a sound level meter app and put it on your phone and calibrate your your speakers and just pick a a number usually it's like 80 or 82 something like that db put pink noise into one speaker and one speaker only and go to your listening position and put the sound level meter meter in front of you pointing straight forward not at the at the um speaker and make sure it says 80, 82 dB or 80 dB, whatever you decided. And then let's say you're doing it on the left one, and then you'll do exactly the same thing on the right one. So you turn the left speaker off, turn the right one on, put white noise through, pink noise through it, and um, then you'll get the same thing, 80 dB or 82, whatever you decided. Then you turn those off. You turn your main speakers off, turn sub on, and put pink noise through it. This time, you don't want 80 dB. You want 4 dB less. So you want 76 dB. Reason for that is the, the bands are different. The frequency bands and the way we hear in the low end is different. 
So it gets calibrated a little bit differently. And this may seem off. It may seem weird. Believe me, this is what works. This is what everybody does. So you just calibrate that for 84, 4 dB less than your main speakers. And you're calibrated. Pretty simple, huh? Um, Victor says there's a great YouTube video on calibrating studio monitors. Just search for it. Uh, I think I did one a long time ago because I used to do this for surround sound a lot. And uh, I was one of the guys that people would call a calibrator systems for a lot of years. And something I don't do anymore because I just don't like doing it, to be honest with you. But uh, anyway, that's the way it's done. So anyway, thank you for being here. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you, you found it useful. And uh, I will see you next month on October's Q&A webinar. And also, again, if you have any questions, you know, just reach out. I'll do my best to help you if I can. Thanks a lot. And uh, we'll talk soon.